Uh, welcome to the SES Taylor Medal Symposium. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Taylor Medals this year, uh, Professor Srini from New York University. Uh, Srini does not need an introduction, so my introduction will be very brief. Um, he was a professor at Yale University doing uh, outstanding work on turbulence. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Science, and American Academy of Arts and Science at a very early stage. Uh, then he became an outstanding administ administrator, became the director of the International Th Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy. Then later become, uh, became the Dean of Engineering at NYU and President of Polytechnic University. Uh, soon, a few years after his desk, he stepped down, he came back to research and he continued to do research. But soon after he came back, stepping down from the administration, he received the Von Kamen Medal from ASC, the Richards Medal from ASME, and also Taylor Medal from uh, SES. Uh, he is really a remarkable uh, researcher, but also outstanding uh, researcher, outstanding uh, administrator. So I will uh, present the floor to uh, Srini. Srini, please. Okay, thank you, Yanggang. And now um, I am going to uh, go full screen. Yes. Um, greetings to all of you on a cloudy day here in uh, Connecticut from my home. I'm uh, truly delighted uh, to be associated uh, with the name of G.I. Taylor, whose picture you see here. The last time I thought um, in any depth about uh, G.I. Taylor was in 2011 when we edited this book, in which I wrote a chapter, chapter four, on uh, G.I. Taylor, the inspiration behind the Cambridge School. I want to quote two sentences from the opening remarks of uh, my chapter just to tell you why I'm so excited about this. One of them is a statement by Brian Pippard, uh, which says, Sir Jeffrey Ingram Taylor, who died at the age of 89, was one of the great scientists of our time, and perhaps the last representative of that school of thought that includes Kelvin, Maxwell, and Rayleigh, who are physicists, applied mathematicians, and engineers, the distinction is irrelevant because their skill knew no such boundaries. And then Sidney Goldstein in 1969 said, by the end of the first half century, that is the 20th century, there was a stronger and more widespread element of physics in thought and research in fluid dynamics, or fluid mechanics, than in the first 20 or 30 years. And this is much more so now. Several factors and several research workers contributed to this, but the greatest influence has been the example of G.I. Taylor. I'm uh, doubly honored uh, because uh, the Society of Engineering Sciences decided to put me in the list of these uh, past luminary recipients, um, which includes uh, James Lighthill, Sidney Goldstein, Dan Joseph, Steve Arsog, George Batchelor, Grisha Barenblatt, Tony Maxworthy, all of uh, whom I knew and are no longer there. And of course, other distinguished people alive that I don't want to put on this list yet. So there are many good reasons why this is exciting to me personally. So thank you, uh, Society of Engineering Sciences. Now this brings me to the title of my talk, um, which is uh, shown here as advertised. But I want to explain this title a little bit. In uh, fluid mechanics, <clears throat> not uh, least because of uh, G.A. Taylor's influence, a phenomenon is uh, assumed to be understood only if experiment and theory come together. Sometimes experiment is behind, sometimes uh, theory is behind, but it is not one or the other. In recent years, however, computations and simulations have become so powerful and so versatile and so sophisticated that they have begun to assume a competitive role. I would like to illustrate the power of these computations and simulations by choosing three examples of massive simulations. I want to say that I could have chosen some other examples, like the one Diego Donzis is going to speak about on compressible turbulence, 
are the one that Karthik Iyer will speak about on scalar turbulence. But these are the examples I've chose. So to some degree, it is my choice and arbitrary. I know that, in fact, if any of you were asked to give the same talk on the same uh, title, you might choose uh, different uh, topics for discussion. So keep uh, that in mind as I uh, go along. So the uh, three choices that I am making for uh, uh, my presentation today are emergence of turbulence, or the onset of turbulence, you might call, heat transport law, and the circulation around closed loops. And in the work, specifically in the work that I'm going to present, I've been uh, very fortunate to have collaborated with these people. Victor Yako, Diego Donzis, Jörg Schumacher on topic one. Jörg Schumacher, and Janet Steele, and Karthik Iyer on topic two. And Karthik Iyer and P.K. Young on uh, topic three. And of course, a number of others whose names will appear at the right places, to all of whom I'm uh, very grateful. And the two flows in which I will look at these three topics are homogeneous and isotropic turbulence and really Bernard convection. Now, uh, if you haven't thought about these flows a lot, I will uh, take a minute to explain what these flows are. One laboratory realization of homogeneous isotropic turbulence is this. is a picture taken in Professor Hassan Nagib's lab, lab many years ago. Um, among many other things, he has become immortal because of this. So what you have is a grid of bars to the left of the screen uh, put against a flowing stream of, of air. And then each, uh, each bar produces a wake, which becomes turbulent. And these merge together to form what is regarded as homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. Especially if you take a, at a look at a region like that, which is not a very large, which is not very large, then it's clear that statistically, no matter where you are, it is homogeneous. And likewise, you can show um, that it is isotropic. That's one flow. The other flow is a so-called Rayleigh-Bernard convection. I took this picture from Charlie Doring's uh, article, but he may have taken it from some other place. I don't know. So basically, looking at the top panel, for instance, uh, this is a container which has a fluid in it. And uh, gravity acts downwards like this. This plate at the bottom is heated. The plate at the top is cooled. So in the, there is a, a certain steady state. And when the heating is relatively little, the heat uh, is transported from the bottom plate to the top plate through the fluid by conduction alone. There is no movement of the fluid. However, if the temperature difference increases a little bit more, then you have a kind of motion, bodily motion of the fluid set up. So the hot fluid rises uh, here and rises here, and the cold fluid um, will sink at the bottom by gravity, and you have these periodic cells that are set up. If you go to higher uh, temperature difference um, uh, in non-dimensional measures, the Rayleigh number, so-called, interesting structures develop. And if you go to even higher temperature differences, you will have a turbulent motion, which is of interest to us. And that's very important in terms of how it enhances the heat transport from the, from, uh, the bottom to the top. Now, let's go to the first topic, the emergence of turbulence. So the question one should ask, is there a general theory or not? In fact, um, uh, I have redefined the problem or the question is how does a multi-scaling turbulent state develop from the background, which I might de describe in uh, some detail later on. Now, in fact, the traditional thinking is that such a general theory does not exist because if you think of turbulence as the ultimate state of successive transitions and instabilities, each flow has a certain characteristic instabilities and you may therefore regard that each one is separate and distinct, and you will have a different route to turbulence all the time. But of course, instabilities do not lead to turbulence. There is always a missing gap between instabilities and turbulence. This is a point that is known very well to some people, but not to maybe many others. But in the last 15 years, on the basis of this general idea, 
uh, there is some uh, evidence that is accumulating in favor of such a theory. I can cite uh, some papers, uh, uh, most of which I was a co-author with. And uh, I will particularly talk about uh, this Yakut and uh, Donzis uh, later on. And I will summarize for you the essential theoretical and computational results to show how they come together and then uh, we can uh, we can move on to the next topic. So let's talk about how we do this in the case of homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. So it's a box which contains the fluid and the boundary conditions are periodic in nature. And you uh, shake the fluid at low wave numbers by using some random Gaussian field. And you can regard this as a computational realization of the picture that I showed you earlier, although there are some detailed discussions we can have about this equivalence. And then after you shake the fluid at low wave numbers, you solve the 3D Navier-Stokes equations on this huge box and evolve the fluid until it is a statistical stationary state and you compute all the properties you need. In particular, for our purposes, we will compute the moments m suffix n of the squares of the velocity gradient from n equals 2 to 6. Now, these uh, moments are representative of the small scale of uh, turbulence, and this is where you have a lot of problem in uh, turbulence, and that's how we will, uh, we will try to characterize the work. And the spatial resolution is subcolmograph because you need a really um, um, very good accuracy for the moments, high order moments that I'm describing. Sometimes 1 60th of the Kolmogorov scale is necessary. And the data records are very long to get excellent convergence. And in fact, the person who is also very much involved is, is Solek Kurshid, who will speak a little bit later on. Now, what you find, um, uh, please forgive these uh, things at the bottom. What you find is, if you plot against the Reynolds number of the flow, that is, you start with low Reynolds number in this uh, case, and then you uh, stir it or force it faster and uh, harder and harder, it becomes higher and higher Reynolds number. And for different Reynolds numbers, uh, whose logarithm you plot on this axis, you plot the logarithm of the moments on the vertical axis. If the uh, state of the flow is Gaussian, then the moments will have the value 2n minus 1 double factorial, where n is the order of the moment. I'm considering here two uh, values of n, n2 greater than 1. Take the case of n1, then it is Gaussian up to certain a Reynolds number, a transition Reynolds number, at which point it takes off on a log-log plot, a straight line, which is a power law, which goes where the moments go like Reynolds number to the power d suffix n1. This is, these are the exponents for fully developed turbulence. So you have the transition from a Gaussian initial state to uh, an asymptotic turbulent state. And now if n2 is greater than 1, and I consider that, that 2 will remain on the Gaussian state 2n2 minus 1 double factorial up to some other Reynolds number. And it takes off again on a different power law dn2, which is what the multiscaling that I talked about is. Now in, in a simulation, this transition does not take place instantly, as I have indicated here in Reynolds number. But you can still see that for, uh, for uh, low values of n, it takes off somewhere here. But at high values of n, it takes off here, which is a little bit lower in Reynolds number. Now, therefore, this, as I have shown here schematically, this transition Reynolds number depends on the order of the moment. However, you can rescale the Reynolds number in, uh, in uh, certain way whose details I will not uh, I will not uh, tell you now such that the transition takes place at one fixed Reynolds number if this is true now if I can actually tell you how to compute these exponents here in the turbulent state and if I can tell you at what um, so-called dress Reynolds number this transition takes place 
essentially, if this is true and generally true, not only for this particular flow, then you will have done some important stuff relating to transition to turbulence. Now, uh, this is in fact what we find and the theory and experiment, uh, experiment being simulations in this case, agree very well in this case. And the question to ask is, what is the value of this critical Reynolds number at which the transition takes place? And it turns out by calculations uh, to be of the order 10, 8.9 or so Victor says, but uh, 10 of the order 10. And 10 is reminiscent of many other Reynolds numbers at which transition takes place in turbulence or fluid dynamics. And now the another question is, is this scenario true more generally? Is it just only true for this particular case? Or does it happen to be true for thermal convection with its complex structure of roles and everything? Or does it happen for a channel flow with its own characteristic structures? I'll try to answer the first question with respect to thermal convection. Although some work has been done for channel flow, it's not strong enough for me to be able to show it to you here. Now, here is the case for the convection. This is the same picture you have seen before. And these are the uh, moments that uh, you plot before on a log scale. And the Reynolds number on this axis also on a log scale. You can see that uh, up to a certain Reynolds number of the order 10, the moments uh, which are computed with great difficulty in these cases is uh, like uh, Gaussian state, three double factorial, five and seven double factorial. And then it takes off on the power loss that are characteristic of fully developed. Term. There seems to be a small intermediate state, which I do not understand, so I will not talk about that. But basically, I will regard this as a confirmation of, a rough confirmation of the general scenario. Now, in uh, this rectangular area, I will say the curtain will be lifted soon, which I will here. Now, what is happening is you will start at very different states, different states from Gaussian, and they relate to roles and, um, and uh, cellular structure and this sort of stuff. So basically, all these initial role structure and the hexagonal structures and spiral structures you see, et cetera, are in some sense presaging the uh, development of the Gaussian state from which the transition to fully developed turbulence takes place. So that's the general idea. And of course, uh, we will have to make sure that this is true for many other cases and redo some of these with greater care and intensity. But that's one problem on which we, I think some progress has been made. And it's a, a novel way of looking at these things and consistent with many other things that people have known them before. So uh, these are the uh, important lessons I learned from this exercise. The two examples uh, I show, um, uh, the transition to fully turbulent state has some common features, transcending the diversity of structure characteristics. In the, Gauss, in the homogeneous isotropic case, it's essentially structureless, whereas in other flows, it has structure to them. The pre-transition stage emerges to be Gaussian, and the transition takes place at a low value of a suitably dressed Reynolds number of the order 10. Okay, so that's the first uh, point. The second one I want to talk about is the asymptotic heat transport law, and I will explain what uh, this means. And I'm not going to consider the theory on bounds and things like that of the sort uh, Charlie Doring uh, has very capably done. Uh, what is the problem I want to understand? On the one hand, uh, there is the so-called Marcus Spiegel formula. I added Spiegel because the coefficient was worked out by him, as far as I know. And uh, these are the references. Basically, what it says is, if you have a fully turbulent state, the Nusselt number, which is the ratio of the actual heat transport to what would be possible only by conduction, that's the efficacy of turbulence in some way, is some constant which is prescribed here very accurately times a Rayleigh number to the power one third. Rayleigh number here is just the non-dimensional measure of the temperature difference between the top and bottom plates. So the more you uh, keep the temperature difference between them, the more heat transport will be possible as indicated by the larger value of Nusselt number. There is another theory, uh, which I might again say Craigman-Spiegel formula, which uh, references are given here. 
which says that the Nusselt number is proportional to Rayleigh number to the power half. Half is quite different from, uh, from one third. And uh, this uh, half is known as, the uh, expectation of that is known as the ultimate state of the asymptotic state. And that's what I wrote down here. And if you read the Spiegel's paper, he, he, he says, the difference between the two formulae is quite striking and its resolution is important. Uh, it will be obvious to all of us. So what does the experiment say? Well, in one experiment in which um, uh, we worked together with uh, Nimla, Skrebek, and Donnelly, uh, whose publications are here, we plot against Rayleigh number, the Nusselt number on this axis, log log plot again. By some clever tricks, we were able to go in the same apparatus from Rayleigh number of the order 10 power 6 or so, to about 10 power 17, which is 11 hours of magnitude, which is a very respectable um, range. And what we found was that the, uh, the data all fit on a very nice uh, power law, although there are small deviations from it, if you look at closely at uh, different points. And this uh, big, uh, power, big power law fit has Nusselt number is 0 0.088 really to the power 0.32. And you should compare it with the Malkus uh, Spiegel formula, which is 0 0.073 really to the power one third. So you might say this really is, um, sets the problem straight, and one third power law is all there is, and half power law simply is uh, irrelevant um, uh, for practical purposes. And in fact, in one of the papers, we uh, worked uh, very hard to um, look at all the errors, possible errors. And we concluded that it was indeed one third. But actually, this uh, the point is not that simple because papers in search of the asymptotic state keep coming because it is there in theoretically, and uh, one always uh, one never knows where the asymptotic state really exists. Um, and in fact, one of the uh, important papers on this uh, topic was is what I have written down here. They said after Rayleigh number 10 to the power 13, the exponent here, uh, which was one third up to there, uh, excuse me, one third up to up to Rayleigh one, 10 to the power 13, uh, took on a value of 0.38. On its way, they speculate uh, towards uh, towards uh, one half. So you have they have uh, claims that you have the asymptotic state. Uh, of course, soon after that, there were uh, papers that actually said uh, it doesn't make much sense. And uh, one of the things, uh, uh, important ones, is Charlie Doring's paper, a uh, comment, which says that they claim by Hay et al. Uh, that their experiment reached the ultimate regime of turbulent Rayleigh Bernard convection is not justified by their own data. Now, it was because of that we set to uh, try to simulate this to the highest possible Rayleigh number in this paper. And uh, because Rayleigh number depends upon the vertical dimension to the power 3, we wanted to keep it as high as possible and to make it computationally feasible, even on the biggest computer available to us at the time, um, we had to make the, uh, the apparatus thin. So the aspect ratio of these calculations is quite thin, small. And you can see the Rayleigh number um, uh, and the grid points that were necessary. Uh, so it's a large simulation done over a long period of time and um, many larger turnover times so you can do accurate, uh, accurate uh, statistics. Uh, here are three pictures which showing you the temperature structure near the bottom of the apparatus. Um, and this shows you what the scale is. Uh, you can see this is really number 11, 10 to the power 11, 10 to the power 13, and 10 to the power 15. As the really number goes up, finer and finer structures develop. And you can measure the heat transport accurately on this and plot that against really number log log plot again. Um, this is old, new, old uh, um, low really number simulations for high aspect ratio, which actually overlap very well with the low aspect ratio ones. And these are low aspect ratio data. And if you want to know whether it's one third or not, it's better to divide uh, the Nusselt number by Rayleigh to the power one third 
and plot it against Rayleigh number. And in fact, you can see that beyond about 10 power 11 or so, uh, the this is constant, which tells you that Nusselt number goes like Rayleigh to the power one third. And in fact, I want you to remind uh, you, I want to remind you that the Malkus formula was that. And the experiment on the helium that I showed you earlier was that. And uh, now what we find is, um, I forgot to say what that is, but here, right here, in this picture, 0 0.053 really to the power 0.33. So all of them are quite consistent with each other. But still there are issues and there are debates going on. But my main point is computations are able to resolve issues like this. Um, I, in fact, uh, the, my, our next order would be to go to higher aspect ratio, which is just beginning to happen. Now, one uh, reason why people think there is the ultimate state is because they think that at some point uh, along the Rayleigh number axis, the boundary layer at the wall becomes um, uh, turbulent, and therefore it becomes a, a, transition, a transition to fully developed turbulence, and that's what gives rise to the half power law. In fact, in our simulations, you measure properties like the wall shear stress, as I've shown uh, here, and its probability density. You can see all of them are uh, collapsing more or less the same, and in fact, they are like what you see in a fully developed boundary layer. So in fact, basically, our claim is not only do we have fluctuations which do not vary in some way as you vary the Rayleigh number, but over a range of Rayleigh numbers, they are the same as what you see in a fully developed turbulent flow. So in fact, there is no more transition that is likely, and therefore no more ultimate state possible. That's the claim at any rate. So what is the conclusion from this part? Up to Rayleigh number 10 power 15, the simulations, which obey boostness conditions and everything, do not show any sign of this asymptotic state for small aspect ratio. What happens to higher aspect ratio still remains unresolved. It appears that some questions can be answered more readily computationally, because in fact, there are many experimental uncertainties which relate to fluid properties, which relate to how the apparatus is constructed, and many other issues related to that. And the Boosnesk approximation, which is really very hard to maintain at very high Rayleigh numbers. And the boundary layers become increasingly and gradually turbulent um, uh, as the Rayleigh number increases, no transition. So though the aspect ratio is very small, the what may matter more is the ratio of the boundary layer thickness to the width of the apparatus, and that is like one over a thousand at the largest Reynolds number, ra largest Rayleigh number, because the boundary layers become so thin at high Rayleigh numbers that uh, that uh, in relation to the aspect ratio, uh, in relation to the horizontal dimension they have a very small uh, relative magnitude. Okay, let me take you to the third part of the, my, my presentation, which very, relates to circulation around uh, closed loops. So you have a closed loop like that described in uh, a turbulent flow. This is an Eulerian contour, that is the contour sits in space. And now what you do is you compute uh, the circulation as we know how to do, line integral around the contour. And by Stokes theorem, it is the it is uh, the vorticity flux uh, um, across the area, uh, which the the curve um, uh, 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 describes. And um, if this is a circle, uh, then R is R square. Let's say R is like the square root of A. So I might call gamma A sometimes and gamma R sometimes. Uh, so you should understand that it is the same quantity. Now, why is this of interest? First of all, circulation is of great interest in fluid dynamics, and we can spend all the time discussing that, but I will not do it. But we were motivated because of, uh, well, first of all, uh, by, uh, by one consideration of Migdal, uh, which he called the area rule. Now, what is that? Uh, suppose I take loops in a plane. Uh, one of them is a square, and the other is a rectangle, uh, as I have shown here. But they're both of the same area. The square has two R on the side, and this one is R and four R on the other side. Now the area rule would say that the circulation around these two loops 
has the same statistical properties. That is, no matter what the shape of the contour, I've just shown you by, uh, by rectangles and squares, but no matter what the shape is, as long as the area um, is the same, then the statistical properties of circulation are the same. Now, what about a figure eight loop like this? That is, I go along here like this and like that and like that, and my area is to the to my left. That means it's a positive thing. It has a sign positive. And I then go down like that. And now the area is on my right. By convention, it will have to have a, a negative sign. Now the question is, uh, if I want to ask myself, to what area should these circulation properties correspond? Should I add the areas vectorially? Um, because one area is negative or uh, algebraically, one area is negative and one is positive, or I should simply not for, not remember the sign uh, attached to it, but just add them up. Now, in fact, we tried to assess these uh, some years ago, uh, experiments and then simulations, but this was 1996 and the simulations were much, much poorer at the time. And in fact, we could not conclude anything at the time. Now, it's only recently that we have been able to answer this question, and this is in this paper, uh, Karthik, uh, PK, and I wrote. And um, these are the simulations in a very on a very large uh, box, and 16384 cube. Remember, Steve Arzog started the uh, box calculations on a 32 cube uh, uh, box. Now, uh, PK, in fact, has uh, 24 cube calculations, although I don't know that anything has been computed on, on those, uh, those, those things. And uh, we performed averages over many realizations uh, for excellent statistical convergence. And what did we find? We find that the area rule is true, uh, largely true. I mean, uh, there's a very big discussion about what is not uh, exactly right and all that kind of stuff in the paper that is published. But basically you can see that if you take two aspect ratios which are uh, different by, by a factor, um, I don't know, in this case eight or something like that, they basically collapse on each other. Uh, uh, never mind this line which happens to be a fit to the data uh, using some theoretical argument, but I will not discuss that. So in fact, the area rule is uh, correct. And for the figure eight loop that I showed, what you need to do is to forget about the sign of the area, uh, but just take the uh, arithmetic sum of the two. But now, what about non-planar loops? For example, like this. This is a soccer gate. Um, so I have, uh, you know, when you remember soccer or whatever, and you see a gate, and um, you see this part lying in the vertical plane, and this part lying in the horizontal plane. And this is a size 2R there, and 2R there, and 2R here. So the area, the actual area of that is, um, is 4R squared. Um, I probably made a mistake somewhere, but never mind what that is. Now, so should I compare the statistics of this loop for a planar loop with an area equal to 4R squared, or as Migdal claimed, uh, should I really compare with the minimal area? Uh, what's the minimal area? Imagine you have a soap film in into which you have dipped this, uh, this soccer gate uh, shape, and the soap film attaches itself to this contour, uh, keeping uh, itself attached to all the edges. And you can compute what the minimal area of that, that area of that is, and that's the minimal area for this contour, and it gives you 3.24 R squared. So the question is, what should we compare with? It turns out it is not, uh, not this area at all, even not even a minimal area, because if you do, and this is one we uh, is coming up one of these days. Um, in fact, even if you take the minimal area, there is a difference between a planar contour and the actual non-planar loop. If you normalize the circulation by some absolute value, but if you normalize the circulation by its own inner variable, inner like the variance, then it turns out that they actually collapse on each other, never mind this uh, lower curve. So in fact, they collapse on each other quite well. So we understand what the limitations of the area rule are 
uh, in planar loops and non-planar loops, etc. Now, why is all this important? Let's talk about the uh, the um, uh, the uh, the classical thing one has done to understand the properties of turbulence as a function of the scale in turbulence. If R is the scale of turbulence, then what one does generally is to take the velocity difference between two points which are separated by a distance r. And uh, if you raise it to the power p, which tells you a stronger and stronger um, uh, 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 strengths of those delta u r, and take the averages, uh, the classical thinking is that these statistical properties vary with the size of this difference or this size of the scale, like r to the power p by 3. Now, um, uh, now, p is something we do not know a priori, but for p equal to 3, we know it to be 3. Therefore, um, delta u r to the power 3, it happens to be uh, just going linearly with r. Now, what is the importance of this? The importance of this is that if, in fact, this is true, uh, that there is a linear relationship in the exponents here, and if I know it for one moment, then I can know for every moment because it's just a linear relationship. And if this is true, the problem of small-scale turbulence would have been solved in 1941. But after many, many years of hard work, it has turned out that if you take, if you take this quantity, it goes not like r to the power p thirds, but r to the power some zeta p. And zeta p is not p thirds except for p equal to 3, uh, but it is uh, they lie on a nonlinear curve. If it lies in a nonlinear curve, what it means is that by knowing one for one value of p, you cannot tell what the value is for the other value. And therefore, you will have to compute the problem for each order moment separately. And that means you have many sc scales or multi-scaling or multi-fractal scaling. And then you will have to contend with infinite number of uh, exponents corresponding to infinite number of moments, which is what a probability density uh, is uh, composed of. Now, that's what is the classical thing with respect to velocity increments. But you can do the same now for circulation. And I take a, a square loop like the one I have shown on the left. And let's say its area is R squared. And I now take uh, the circulation um, around uh, a loop like that of size r, raise it to the power p, and then I uh, move, move my, my square around everywhere in the flow, and then average over all, po all possible places. And I ask myself, well, will it scale like r to the power lambda p? And will lambda p uh, behave like uh, zeta p, in which case there is no simplification? Or will there be a, some simplification, fundamental simplification that is possible? Now well, that's the question. And what we have against r here, logarithm of r, versus uh, this gamma rp also in logarithmic units. Now each of them corresponds to a different value of p, 2, 4, 6, and 8. And if there is a power law, uh, this must be a straight line on this log log plot as in fact it seems to be. You can do better than that by actually computing the local slopes of these lines. And if it is a real power law, then it, the local slope must be constant. And that's what I have plotted here on this axis, r here and local slope on this axis here. And you should be considering only between the two vertical lines because uh, that's where um, the scaling is supposed to take place. And the lines here, the horizontal lines, are the Kolmogorov values. You can see that for r equal to, for p equal to two, it is almost exactly Kolmogorov. This is almost like Kolmogorov for four, but by eight, it, by whatever eight or so, it changes. Six, it changes, and by eight, it changes. There is a difference as you go up in the r to the moment. So let's plot them. This lambda p as as a uh, as a function of p, um, here it is. So there's lambda p here as a function of p. And for small p, up to about p or um, 4 or so, it plots very nicely on the, on the Kolmogorov line. And thereafter, 
it deviates from the Kolmogorov line, but actually deviates in a very trivial way. It is on a straight line, unlike in, uh, in the case of structure functions of what I showed you moments of the velocity increments, where it is a nonlinear curve. Here it's a straight line. So in fact, what you have, uh, if this is all true, what you have is that instead of having an infinite parameter problem, you have sort of reduced it to two parameters, one of which is the Kolmogorov thing, and the other of which is this line, which actually happens to be characterized by a fractal set of 2.5. This is a space filling set, and for high order moments, it's, it lives on a fractal set whose dimension is two and a half. So if this is true, you can actually see how the problem can be simplified enormously. And then uh, there, are, there are already theoretical efforts that such amygdala is spearheading where this kind of thing has been exploited. We will have to wait and see whether something really comes out of it. So the summary of this part is that um, circulation statistics depend essentially on the area of the loop, not on the aspect ratio. Uh, in, in planar loops. And there's a decent scaling range and the scaling exponents are closely linear with respect to the art of the moment. Low moments seem to be closely K41, that is Kolmogorov 1941. But high moments seem to reside on a fractal set of dimension two and a half. Circulation is therefore less intermittent and um, very simple in character. And this has some implications on the vorticity structure in the, in the flow, et cetera. So I have uh, essentially come to the end of my talk. Um, and therefore, let me um, make a closing remark on the entire talk. I have given you uh, remarks in summary fashion for each part separately. But on the big picture that I talked about in terms of what uh, simulations and computations are doing in order to advance the field, uh, comp uh, I want to say this. Complex fields such as turbulence can advance only by symbiotic research between experiments, simulations, and theory. Each of them has certain strengths, and each of them actually highlights the weaknesses of the other. Uh, it's really very important. Sometimes we think experiment is the last word or computation is the last word because Navier-Stokes are really so uh, very appropriate for fluid flow and all that. But uh, in fact, that's not exactly true. I, I can see. Uh, many cases where it's a symbiotic relationship that uh, pitches, uh, puts one against the other and tries to get at the truth that uh, advances the field. Truth in this kind of field is very hard to reach. It's because you really don't have a good understanding of many body physics. And we um, therefore, um, uh, we really have to work very hard. And computations have become a powerful tool, sometimes surpassing and sometimes inspired by theory and experiment. Theory has been harder. Uh, Charlie Doring will probably say something about theory uh, in relation to um, a convection, but I don't know what he will say. Large and versatile numerical databases of 3D Navier-Stokes turbulence are now available at different places. And uh, PK, and uh, as we uh, have this uh, huge database of uh, things, and uh, Jorg and I, we have on the on the con convection. And they can be used to query essentially any desired property and evaluate existing or new theories and help build new ones. I discussed three recent examples briefly and summarized the specific lessons learned. But as I said, those are not the only things I could have chosen. And you would have chosen different topics perhaps. But the general idea that uh, computations have really come a long way in order to advance pressing problems only by answering which you can advance the field as a whole. So uh, that's one of my main points is that we are closer to theory than ever before. Um, and um, we can discuss this too at uh, some length. So now I would like to close by thanking all the people um, that I want to thank, or at least some. Uh, first of all, you, the mostly invisible audience. I have no idea whether you have enjoyed my talk, uh, whether <laughs> you have switched off or gone off somewhere. Uh, but I, I uh, thank you nevertheless. And I thank the Society of Engineering Science, especially its secretary and conference chair, Professor Hank Wing 
uh, John, uh, for promptly answering my numerous questions uh, by being really uh, ready. And uh, Professor Yang Huang for his friendship and support, including chairing this session. And of course, uh, many people must have written uh, letters for me, but I don't know who they are. I uh, thank them all for their support. All the speakers in this session to whom I acknowledge my debt, uh, they would probably not be here uh, without me. And um, I'm very grateful for that. Um, Hassan Nagib, whom I've known for many, many years. Dan Lathrop, um, again, many years. Sachin Bharadwaj, who is my graduate student now. Susan Kurian, also known, <laughs> my former graduate student, whom I know very well as well. Charlie Doring, whom I mentioned a few times. P.K. Young, Karthik Ayer, who recently uh, became a professor. Carl Shapiro, uh, whom I did not see in the, in the, anywhere on the backstage and things like that. Saleh Kurshid, um, Diego Donzis. Saleh works with me and Diego, um, uh, of course. Paul Strykowski, my first graduate student. Uh, Leslie Smith, who was my colleague at Yale for a number of years. Ellen Longmire, who has been very kind to join this, as is Adonio Scarpertis, who used to work with me for a few years, and uh, Krishnan Mahesh uh, from uh, Minnesota. I thank you all very much, and uh, I greatly uh, um, am privileged to be speaking on this occasion like this. Thank you. Bye.